Hello, my name is uh, Ricardo Rodriguez. Uh, today's uh, session is a clinician's guide to fat graphs. I'm Ricardo Rodriguez, and I am being uh, overshadowed by Camilo Ricordi today. Uh, um, let me uh, just start out here by saying I'm the president of IFATS uh, this year uh, for 2016, and I invite you all to the IFATS conference in, uh, in San Diego in November. It's the one conference where the whole topic of study is uh, fat cells and regeneration, and uh, I encourage you to submit papers and uh, to go there. It's a great conference. I go there every year. Anyway, so you might be wondering, uh, why do we have a plastic surgeon here? We just had another two plastic surgeons before. Now you got me again talking to you. Um, you know, plasticos, the name of plasticos is a Greek word, it says ca capable of being shaped or molded. And we refer to it as tissues, and you know, it, it's a, a confluence of interest because uh, cellular biologists are interested in the same thing, how, ce how cells are shape and mold it and can change their function or how we can manipulate them to do something. So we have um, a, a common interest in at least an outlook of how we uh, look at things and we are natural allies in this thing and we just haven't communicated enough and I think that as we get down in the processing of fat and we get more and more to the cellular level we'll find that common ground and work together and find uh, new solutions. So. Uh, what you're seeing here on the left, that's Thomas Krizak. He was a founder of plastic surgery at uh, Yale University, which is where I trained. And uh, he said a lot of things, but a lot of great things. One of the ones that I liked was, um, I should like to be a surgeon who could make wings. And to build wings, one must learn to see wings. And I think that that's really appropriate to, uh, as we start entering into regenerative medicine, in order to be able to deploy to its fullest, we have to really envisage new things and things we want to do. And what you're seeing on the right is a Yale Bulldog, and uh, he's sporting a Tagliacozzi flap. It's uh, the oldest flap known to the Western world. Uh, essentially, you would take skin from the forearm, elevate it on a pedicle, stick it to your nose, put it on the defect on the nose, and it would vascularize. The, the, the native tissue would vascularize the flap. They would form a vascular bridge. Then you would cut it at the root and set it into the nose, and that was your uh, nasal reconstruction. Uh, 10 to 12 days later, you, you know, section the graph, inset it, and that was your nasal reconstruction. Um, it has been used for at least 2,800 years that we know of. It was used by the Indians. Uh, it was in this textbook. It's actually described. It's the... Um, it's, it's the uh, Sushruta Samhita, it's a, it's a medical textbook from about six to 800 BC, and they were already using it, but uh, after a while, religious uh, uh, cultural changes in India made it uh, an undesirable profession because it was in contact with blood and pus, so uh, development on that stopped. It was given to the lowest case, the untouchables, so the knowledge was not transmitted by people who could write. It was just performed by illiterates. So that knowledge was lost for like 2,400 years. Then uh, the Italians uh, rediscovered it, and that's uh, Tagliacozzi, uh, who made that drawing and uh, popularized the uh, technique, even though he himself was not a surgeon. Um, then uh, it was rediscovered again at uh, World War I with, by Sir Harold Gillies. Uh, out of necessity, the deformities that were being incurred in World War I, as, as, as people improved the ability uh, to have soldiers survive, you have more of these uh, disabilities. And uh, he founded the first unit of plastic surgery at Queen's, Queen Mary Hospital uh, in London to deal with wartime injuries. And uh, he discovered this uh, flap, the, this uh, what we call later the gold wing flap from the forehead down to here. But his key insight was, and he made it into a, um, a saying, is plastic surgery is the uneasy marriage between beauty and blood supply. And that really motored plastic surgery uh, evolution up to now. It's, we were really keyed in on finding out the blood supply, optimizing it, designing flaps all around the concept of the uh, blood supply. And plastic surgeons, the way we think is, you know, when we see a defect, um, we, we, we make ourselves a, a, a set of priorities as to how to reconstruct it. The first is, secondary intention, and that has an old traditional history. Ambroise Paré in the 18th century said uh, 
uh, je l'ai pensé, Dieu le guéri, which means, you know, I dressed it, God healed it. And that was the body doing its own regeneration and healing it. Then we came up with a primary closure, the wound was ready. And if the wound was dirty or it had any kind of contaminated thing, it was a delayed primary closure. I trained at a very uh, warlike uh, hospital in Louisiana, Charity Hospital. And when a patient, for example, came in with an infected uh, foot amputation, we used to do what's called an ice tourniquet. We used to just tourniquet the leg off so that uh, blood flow was cut off completely to the distal leg. Way to stabilize the patient, get the sugar normal, get him in good medical condition, and then do a clean amputation, and it worked. And that was, you know, another old theory. The other thing that we used to do was uh, tissue grafts. Uh, we used to try to fill in defects, but that was that never really took wings, except for for superficial coverage, a skin graft or a full thickness skin graft. And again, the thinner the skin graft the better the blood supply to all layers of the tissue, so the better the survival. So that was another aphorism. The thinner the graft, the better the take. So, but when, de when defects, as defects became uh, more complex, you needed to develop these flaps. And, and that was what Harold Gillies did. He developed these flaps for these complex injuries. And the first flap is they're called random flaps. And they're classified in terms of uh, complexity. And a random flap is, for example, if you take this map of the vasculature, it's just drawn in like that with no describable blood supply. And it just really depends on the blood supply on the capillary density of the area. And since some areas of the body have greater capillary densities, some flaps uh, have more reliability or you can make them longer than they were wide, etc. Then people started figuring out that you could do an axial flap following an individual blood vessel. And you could make those flaps very long as you included the all the blood vessel with it. And then finally, once they started developing these longer flaps with a described blood vessel, the next intellectual leap saying was, well, let's just take the blood vessel itself with the tissue attached to it, and then we'll attach it somewhere else. And that was called a free flap, okay? And the free flap really uh, unleashed uh, the imagination for two reasons. Uh, first of all was we could take more and more complex hunks of tissue from different parts of the body remotely and in one setting in the operating room use it in a new uh, field. But it allows us for the first time to treat all these, uh, uh, we could deliver blood supply to an area of PPP and PPP is piss poor protoplasm. And what we were doing was we were bringing new blood supply new tissue to an area to heal it. So we could take big radiation burns. People like this used to uh, die of what's called carotid blowout. The radiated tissue here right on top of the carotid would die. They would exsanguinate within seconds in the unit. Now we were able to treat those. Then uh, we could treat a huge open complex wounds with osteomyelitis in them. We're putting muscle from the belly with skin and covering it and actually treating the osteomyelitis. And things such as electrical burn with complex injuries like this, which would have meant a proximal amputation, all of a sudden we could save limbs. So that was the era of the 70s when I came into uh, plastic surgery. And, and that was really a, a, a romantic and beautiful thing to me that we could take areas of the body and put them somewhere else and take bone and repurpose it. And it, it was very inspiring. And, uh, you know, you could, this is a, one example. Uh, uh, a tissue from the abdomen which you isolate on its blood vessel and even though it's abdominal tissue now you can build a breast with it and you can build it with tissue from the abdomen and really really beautiful reconstructions not only that but then we could take like real big disasters like big huge t uh, tissue defects and again harvest these enormous amounts of tissue and and uh, to heal the uh, defect and you know, uh, uh, plastic surgery is saying, uh, another one of the aphorisms is, uh, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, without making Paul complain too much. And, uh, but at some point, Paul runs out of money and uh, he just can't handle it and the donor defect's too big. And so, uh, Ian Taylor came up with this concept of what's called um, uh, angiosomes. And you could take a complete vascular territory including bone and the muscle overlying and the skin overlying it. It became really sophisticated, big, complicated flaps. And that was what I, I think that that's the, almost the apex of development of the free flap area when we get this huge chunks of tissue. The problem is that sometimes the donor can't take it. Okay, so that led to the next uh, 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 
plateau of development in, in, in that approach to delivering the blood supply, which is delivering the blood supply intact with the surrounding tissue. And that was the allo uh, transplantation of huge units of tissue with everything included in it, functional tissues. And, and this is from the NYU uh, case of facial transplant. And uh, it, it was captained uh, by Ed Rodriguez, uh, no relation of mine, who actually did his first face transplant at, um, at Hopkins, where, which is, you know, I practice in Baltimore. And uh, so, you know, that requires huge teams of people. And it's for one case. So, for example, this is a team involved in the facial transplant uh, at um, at NYU. So it's got all kinds of specialists, immunologists, infectious disease, all sorts of medical specialties. So it's a very capital intensive resource for very rare cases. So in a sense, to me, this whole approach is now almost like an exotic flower. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, but not really applicable to my practice, okay, or to anything I do. So we come back to the reconstructive ladder and we come to the thing, one of the things that have been discredited before. Sure, the th th uh, split thickness and the full thickness graphs were a mainstay, but there was another one that had a really bad name, fat. It was considered unreliable. It was considered a bad graft. And I tried it in my residency. We used to think that if we carry some of the fat with some of the dermis, it'll take better. But really, it, it never really worked the way I wanted it to. Some people could make it work. But fat had a bad reputation. And as a matter of fact, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons in 1987 put out a position paper saying, don't do fat grafts. It's a bad thing. Now, this is the institutional body of plastic surgery saying that. So when I talk about this man, Sidney Coleman, is with the greatest admiration. This guy was alone in New York in his little clinic, and he was working with fat grafts and saying, I can make something out of this. And, and really, we owe a lot of what we do uh, today uh, to him. And his analysis of the fat grafting was long-term survival of fat, fat transplants, control demonstration. So he was just trying to show that you could transplant fat. Not only could it survive, it could hold its volume for some time. So he starts doing that. And some people that listen to his uh, conferences and all that, they agree with him. They start doing it sotto voce, like the Italians would say, and uh, do a little bit here, a little bit there. But it slowly started getting uh, impetus, okay? And um, what people started noticing was all these other weird stuff. And, and, I, and I am putting this article here. This is Ian Jackson. He was a craniofacial surgeon. And he was at a conference, you know, all these little chichi plastic surgeons they go skiing together, and there's like very high academic ones, and they put out this case of this woman with this old rhabdomyosarcoma 20 years ago as one of these difficult cases that they put in their brain trust. And Ian Jackson said, even though he's a career professor, said, well, I'll just do some lipo and do some lipo transfers. And it worked. And not only that, as he kept following her, he started noticing that the tissue will kept getting better. Okay, so this is published in 2001, and that's a landmark year, and I'll explain to you in a little bit. So in 2001, he publishes his papers. It already has five years of um, uh, follow-up time. A few years later, Sidney Coleman himself publishes this article, this guy, another guy with a radiation to the jaw after another uh, tumor, and he also noticed the quality in the tissue, the change in elasticity. So in other words, it wasn't just a feeling of the vol volume, it was a changing character of the tissue that had happened. So Sidney Coleman's genius was to break down the whole process of fat grafting into process engineering. And what he said was, the reason all these other guys are having mixed results and everybody's having mixed results is everybody's doing it this way and that way a different way, but the way you do it really counts and it's really important. And there's a lot of steps to it. It's like a computer program. You can follow all the instructions. You miss one instruction, it doesn't run, or it runs bad, or it gives you a bug, whatever. So his theory was that if you could deliver these little pearls that were small enough so that the body could fully vascularize the pearl, or that was exposed to the general circulation, your fat would survive, and it wouldn't lose volume, and it wouldn't cause you problems, and it wouldn't cause 
uh, inflammation. So the steps involved are quite a few, and these can even be broken down. But for example, the cannula. The cannula is important. Uh, what kind of pressure you take it out is important. How you purify it's important. How you re-inject it. And we're just going to go through those steps because I just want to give you a taste for like if you're going to get into this, you got to get serious about it and you got to follow a process and you got to be really meticulous at all the steps in the process. And if you follow all the steps in the process, you're going to have very good results. And not only are you going to have very good results, the fat is going to do its magic. Okay, so we noticed that the fat was doing the magic and we knew that it was doing the magic and it was in 2001, okay, the same year that that paper was published, that the lab at uh, University of Pittsburgh, out of the work of Adam Katz and uh, William Futrell, who was the chief of plastic surgery there, that was when they finally discovered that there were fat, that there were MSCs in uh, uh, fat. And not only that, it had the highest concentration per unit volume than anywhere else in the body, including bone marrow, by factors of three to 400 times as much. And it was a serendipitous thing. Uh, Adam was in the lab to looking at these cells. They were trying to uh, culture fat. They were trying to grow fat so that they could re-inject it. And he kept getting all these fibroblasts, what he thought was fibroblasts. And uh, one day, he's in the lab. He's got time to go see other lectures. Uh, Mark Pittenger uh, went by to the University of Pittsburgh, gave a lecture, and he's giving a lecture about stem cells. And Adam's looking at the screen. He can't believe his eyes. He says, those are the same cells that I'm seeing. Those look like stem cells. And then he did the laboratory work to corroborate, and he saw that they differentiated into all the tissues. So that's how that paper came about. And so the active agent is uh, what Arnold Kaplan calls the medicinal stem cells, and they do all their work uh, with all these uh, cytokines and all of that, and that's why fat works. And fat is a regenerative agent when you treat it nicely, okay? And that's the whole point of this talk, that when you're dealing with fat, you gotta treat it right, because otherwise it's not gonna work, okay? And so what is the best way to deliver that active agent in the fat, okay? So uh, we're used to think in terms of traditional pharmacology, like, like botanicals, you know? You had the digitalis leaf, and out of that came out the digitalis molecule that you use and use to treat the heart. So we're trying to find the key ingredient. So when I started thinking about this, my first project, and, and you know, I'm a plastic surgeon, we all have huge egos, so as a private practitioner, I applied for a federal R1 grant, you know, whatever. So and I was going to use uh, cultured cells because I thought, okay, MSCs, I'm going to use cultured cells. But the more I read about it and the more I try to think about this, I thought, you know what? The crosstalk between the cells, I think that matters. And that's been corroborated in many other, including in cardiac and, and uh, you know, a lot of these cells don't work by transforming into anything. We know that they work by telling other cells what to do. And even when you get allogeneic stem cells and you transplant it, those are gone within a few weeks. But the change in behavior in the native tissue continues and continues to work. So maybe these effector cells come for something and they work. But you know what? That's like taking all the personnel out of the factory, blowing out of their factory and saying, here, we're going to put you in the middle of the desert, do your thing. They can rebuild it. They can do the stuff. But I think, and there's, we're beginning to think, that maybe their best functional unit is put the factory there on the desert, and they'll be able to do it much better and in a much more intact way. And Dr. Ricordi himself was the one that pointed this out to me, that this parallels the history of, of understanding and conceptualization of how pancreatic uh, islets work, that in the beginning they try to isolate them uh, by collagenase, and they try transplanting the... Uh, cells and they didn't work that well, then they try to culture them and they worked a little bit better. But now really what they're doing is they're transplanting intact units of, small enough intact units of pancreas that they can survive inside the body with transplanted and that's what works the best. And I think that that's the realization that I'm coming to think in terms of fat because we're seeing fat do everything that, that, like, that I used to think that would only be done by SVF and, and, and cultured cells, I'm beginning to see with this. I mean, I'm treating a lot of radiation with just fat grafting. And if you, and if you do it well, there are real tangible changes. And Dr. Rigotti has demonstrated ultra-structural changes. It's not just a fat repopulation. It's, a, it's an actual reprogramming of the native tissue done by just fat without SVF. So, <coughs> 
the reason you got to treat the fat graft kindly is that if we think of fat graft, and especially the FDA thinks of fat graft like fat, and it's a structural tissue. And, but it's no, it has like two different populations of cells. One, whoops, one population which can really take a joke, which are the SVF cells. They're small, they got a very tight integrity because they have a lot of the cytoskeleton still intact going from nucleus to membrane, so it's a hardy cell. And it behaves more like a viscoelastic solid uh, that, than a blubbery thing like a fat cell. And uh, they're, le they're more dense uh, than water. So that's your like quote unquote agent. And then your, uh, but then the agents, you know, they differentiate into all the different cells and, and the main component of it is this fat cell that's full of a, this globule. And you can imagine this big old balloon with a thin rubber membrane, you stress it out a lot, it's gonna bust. And that's exactly what happens to these adipocytes. You know, you jostle them around a lot, a lot of them are gonna die. And, and what happens when they die? They release a lot of lipopolysaccharides. That's what they do. They make lipopolysaccharides, they store them, and all of that. Except that, and, and so, by the way, so as we go treating the fat graft, and uh, this is a slide from Jeff Gertner from Stanford, uh, where he goes and he goes, you know, a, as we do the fat grafting process from harvest, to implantation, it's a progressive inexorable decrease in viability uh, of the fat graft. And I think, yes, that reflects his uh, practice, but I think that with good process engineering, we can change this curve and we can bring it up and we can preserve a lot. It's not predetermined to be like that. We just have to be conscious of what we're doing and really focus on, on saving the graft. So this is why it matters because when you get those fat cells that die, and they release all those uh, lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides, when you're going to do an experiment about stimulation of toll-like receptors, which are uh, uh, inflammation drivers of cells, the, the agent of choice for the model is lipopolysaccharides. Okay, so uh, the lipopolysaccharides get into, you know, stimulate the, L the TLR receptors in the cell. They stimulate this huge inflammatory reaction. So what happens? We think of stem cells as reconstructive stem cells because that's how we know them. We tender them beautifully in the lab, we culture them, and we make them do wonderful things. They become this, they become that, they heal this, they heal that. But the reality is that under proper stimulation, they can get very pissed off and they then become agents of inflammation. And now, just like they captain a whole reconstructive process, now they're gonna captain a whole destructive process. Okay, and the end result is like what we see here. This is a fat graft done by somebody who probably just sucked out the fat whichever way, you know, process I don't know how, and then probably injected I don't know how. And so you get, you know, a lot of lipopolysaccharide release, huge inflammatory reaction, and you end up with this. And that's a good case. If you put it in a joint or if you put it, in, uh, uh, some people are doing gluteal things and they end up with big uh, abscesses and all that. I mean. Horrible things have, ha have happened with fat, which is why it got the bad name in the first place. So let's go through the process from beginning to end. With the extraction, okay, the first thing is the negative pressure, half atmospheric pressure. That's backed up by data. Don't stick your cannula with a liposuction machine on in full, which is what a lot of people do. Put it at half atmospheric pressure, you get much better um, uh, viability with it. The cannula itself, who knew? that the holes, this makes a difference. The little holes in the cannula. And the, nobody's, when, when I look at, when I'm gonna buy cannulas now and I buy, they'll have the diameter of the cannula listed and they have the length of the cannula. They don't even tell you the size of the holes. I have to call them and ask them, what's the size of your hole? Because I know my, my fragment, I want it to be very small so that I don't need injecting a big fragment. So to me right now, the cannula that I'm using is like this, one millimeter holes which is gonna give me a very small fragment, and that's what I use. And you also want a three millimeter diameter. Now this cannula I'm showing here is very interesting because this cannula, that particular configuration, for whatever reason, and we don't really understand why, gives you the best yield as far as number of SVF cells per gram of tissue. Even compared with the same type of hole in a four millimeter diameter, this one gives you the best yield. And I think that, as we will see later in the, in the talk, I, I will use this when I'm gonna be using other type, other equipment. 
So the next one is how we purify. Decantation, I'm only mentioning it to say don't do it. Okay, decantation alone is not going to get rid of a lot of the inflammatory cytokines. The minute you stick that cannula and you start shoving it back and forth, it says injury. And when you get injury, the first thing you do, all the alarm bells goes off, inflammation, kill the bad guys, and then after we kill all the bad guys, then we start rebuilding and we do the nice things. So you get a lot of those inflammatory cytokines in there. So doing that is not going to be enough. The next thing you can do is wash it. Wash away all that junk, okay? And you're going to get a better uh, um, a product. And this is a device I've worked a lot with. It's uh, from a company named GID. And inside it has a paddle to trap fi fibrinous debris and all that. They call it debris. I think that's extracellular matrix. I like the extracellular matrix, so I don't like taking it off. Um, but anyways, it just washes it. It has a mesh to get rid of the oils and all that. This is a good thing, okay? The nice thing about it for somebody who doesn't do a lot of fat grafting is that it's a system. You don't think about it too much. You get it. You get a good, clean product. The next is centrifugation. This is uh, one of Sidney Coleman's biggest uh, contributions was we were centrifuging the cells. He centrifuges them at uh, 1,100 Gs. I like a lot lower Gs. It's just gentler in the cells. And I just want a separation. And yes, I do want to stress some of the bigger adipocytes. I want them to die. They're big. They're not going to do me any good. They've reached the end of their life. I don't want them bust up. I don't care. They go off to the top as an oil layer, and I can eliminate that. And then I eliminate the infranatum fluid layer, and I'm left with a very clean, what we call a fat cake. Okay? And when you start getting more proficient at this, then you know that the lower part of the fat cake is more SVF rich, because since it's denser, because it has a higher proportion of the smaller cells and the bigger cells. So when you want precision in some parts of the face, uh, where you want really tight control of volume and all that, then you'll use the, what's called the, the, the heavier part of the fat cake. Then we go to reinjection. I'm putting a picture of this. These guns, don't use them. Okay, this is like the worst possible combination. First of all, you have a very small caliber syringe, so the, the force and pressure is really magnified. And then on top of that, as if that were not enough, then you get mechanical advantage with a lever. So you're like, I'm going to kill this cell. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to inject it. Okay, so don't use that. The other thing is, after you got that little clump of fat, you got to stick it through a needle. And people like don't think. They, they think in, in cells in terms of cytokines and behavior and this and that. And they're not thinking in terms of actual dimensions. What is the size of your pellet of fat? What is the size of your needle? And what's happening, for example, if they go with a regular cannula with a big hole, which is what most people are still using, they're going to take a three millimeter diameter glove of fat and if they're doing it in the face, they're going to shove it through here. Okay, that through here is like, it ain't happening. Or it ain't happening the way you want it to. It's happening, but it's like not happening well. Okay, and then even through a 14 gauge needle is no good. So I like the one millimeter, you know, and I am using larger uh, bore needles. I stopped using this. The small cannula diameter was used when we were, where we were thinking, okay, I want a small depot. And yes, we do want a small depot, but you don't want to shove stuff through it and deliver a crunched up piece of fat that's no good. So I do now in my practice, what I do mostly is one millimeter uh, uh, fat globules, and then I try to put them through larger bore needles. And when you do that, you can do incredible things. It's not unusual for me to inject a full liter of fat into somebody's butt, okay? And that's like, to me, it blows my mind that I can do that and not get in trouble. But, you know, when the fat is good, it works. And it's almost like a miracle, okay? And then we have the shear. Uh, the people at Harvard, what, a few years ago, they studied all these factors in the injection. And what they saw was that the most important thing, more than pressure, because I thought, I used to think pressure was the main factor, the most important one was uh, uh, shear, shear damage. And, and what happens with your regular cannula, that at the inside of the metal is like this, is very rough, and you're making your fat, all those little delicate blubbery fat cells, in the, there you're thrashing them as they go through here. And that's a picture of after a single injection through, it's all accumulated with debris. So those are mashed up fragments going through those needles. So 
I have since switched to tulip uh, needles. They're called self-friendly, and they have an interior that's treated. I think a couple of other manufacturers do them too. But the fat goes really easy, and you can feel it when you're injecting. It goes very softly. You're applying very little pressure. It does very well, very little damage to the fat globule. And then finally, I come, you've gone through all this road of really getting your best thing, and then comes your depot size. Okay, and this is like extremely important. And we go back to the perils, and this is where Sydney was so prescient from the beginning. I mean, the, the guy has lasted as long, and, and his things have been so far reaching that all his guesses from the beginning have been like prophetic. And the peril thing is really key. And so, uh, Yoshimura from Japan actually studied fat droplets of all sizes inside mice and all that. And what he discovered was that when you put a fat globule inside, the outer 300 uh, micron part of the, uh, uh, of the globule will survive. There's an intermediate zone in here that survives or doesn't survive. But what that means is like from here on, it's like war. It's war between the inflammatory signals and the regenerative signals, and whoever wins on that particular day, on that particular condition, is how you're grafted. And that, to me, is like unpredictability, the very definition of. So I want my fragment to be like 600 microns. I want the whole thing to be within the diffusion distance of oxygen, which is to about 200 microns. So as long as your whole fragment is within that, all the cells in your fat are going to live. And then what happens? Once all your fat cells live and all your uh, fragment survives intact, you're not just delivering a fat graft now. You're delivering an intact functional unit, a niche, in its natural working state. So like, I don't need to digest the thing for SVF and all that. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, I do research, like I said, and I, and I am using SVF to treat radiation injury in a, in a study, but uh, the biologist that's working with me, that's the first thing he said, well, you always kill a few, and they're not really that healthy for a while. And I'm going like, gee, that's my therapeutic tool, cells that I just killed a few, and some of them are not that. And so, but when you, when you got this, you got the intact niche, you know, and it's housed like it was housed in the body, and it can receive the signals. It's within diffusion distance of cytokines and oxygen, so it's receiving all the messages. And then all the cells in your niche, the SVF, which is now in your niche and intact, will do what it needs to do. It'll either jump out of the vessel wall if it needs to, it'll tell the cells around it what to do. So as far as fat grafting, size matters. It's really crucial, okay? And whether a thing is like, very small, you know, this is a, a, a you know, like a millimeter uh, scale. So as long as you got your fat globules that are very small, you know, in the 600 to 800 range, this is going to behave very differently than that, okay? And I think that this is like potentially, if it works out, a big future for fat grafting and for regenerative medicine. Because if we can find a way to deliver consistently, okay, this, I think we're going to see a tremendous increase in the uh, functionality and power. And uh, Dr. Camilo Ricordi is going to speak now uh, about that very thing and these very fragments that you're seeing here. Camilo. And I'm, and I'm really happy to be able to present because the story of our interaction has been quite uh, interesting. Like, so he came originally to the Cell Transplant Center in Miami. This is the institute I direct. I say, what, what is the director of a diabetes center uh, aiming at the cure of type 1 diabetes doing with fat grafting? And uh, this is uh, where, where I work. Our institute housed the stem cell, uh, the Cell Transplant Center at the University of Miami, which is uh, uh, six-story tower wait do you have the yeah the pointer is the a pointer. little red thing right here the red red this line one. yeah okay and uh so is that this is the uh, research tower cell transplant center with the fourth floor cgmp facility has been approved and been used to uh, deliver cell product for advanced cell therapies across the United States and also 
uh, in Europe and in Australia. Uh, I will not, uh, if you're interested in the field, you can check out this open access uh, uh, article that uh, is very good reading material if you suffer of insomnia, has 400 references and tells you the whole story of early transplantation and processing in the last 25 years. Uh, I was saying Carlo Tremolada came to the Cell Transplant Center to see me once and uh, said we cannot understand, can you help us understand why these uh, cell products that we're using are working so much better than what we were using before uh, since you have all the infrastructure for assessment, characterization, etc. in the cell transplant center. And says we, we started doing this uh, re reduction in the cluster size of uh, li lipoaspirates mainly to use smaller needles, to use less anesthesia and do local and do this kind of procedure like in this case uh, correction of uh, A-lead bags uh, in this girl. And uh, what turns out <coughs> is that the product that they obtain can indeed be uh, injected through, is much more fluid and can be injected through smaller needles compared to the traditional lipofilling uh, technique. But also when you inject it then in tissues, like in this case in a muscle, it can distribute much better throughout the fibers in the tissue that you try to infiltrate locally and so it's been uh, quite interesting because for us this in islet transplantation we know if a cluster is bigger than 500 micron doesn't survive very well and develop central necrosis when you inject it in the wherever transplant site you inject it so then <coughs> the other big difference is that it, it doesn't use any enzyme in this processing so instead of uh, doing collagenous digestion was a mechanical uh, cluster size reduction in the lipogen system. So uh, practically this is how it, it works. Like you have uh, two filters to screen, one is four millimeter, one is one millimeter, and you push uh, the lipoaspirate through the first size reduction uh, in a full immersion system, so there is no air fluid interface, otherwise it would be very damaging for the cells and the natural of proteins. So it's a, with no air in the system, you pass through the first screen size reduction, then you have a washing step in counter flow to remove the oil residues and the blood residues in this uh, bag, and then you flip the device and uh, and do the second size cluster reduction and that gives you the product ready for uh, injection. So this is actually how it works. It's actually how it doesn't work. Uh, here, good. So you see this is the smaller device. There are two devices, one that is like 240 milliliters and this is a 60 milliliter volume to process smaller amount of uh, lipoaspirate, so you pass through the first screen, then you <coughs> agitate it, this is full immersion, so it's very gentle, even if it appears traumatic, but it's actually uh, very gentle inside, and you wash the system through counter flow so that you remove all the oil residue, then you pick up saline from this, uh, and now you flip up the smaller screen, the white screen, and, and then you pass it through that screen and you have the final product ready for um, clinical use. So surgeon likes it because it's a point of care, like you, you can have the patient in the office or in the operating room and in 15 minutes you have the final product ready to be injected. It's a disposable kit, doesn't require a CGMP cell processing facility, enzyme or any um, specialized equipment or, or even a centrifuge. And if you look at confocal microscopy at these uh, <laughs> clusters, you immediately can appreciate that besides the adipocytes, you have this network of cells that are not fat cells, that is the stromal vascular fraction, pericytes, uh, MSC, uh, what have been then uh, characterized. And as you know, uh, Bruno Peult and uh, Arnold Kaplan has been working a lot on this hypothesis on, on pericytes, how they could be the component in this uh, fat grafting that could be triggered and activated by inflammation or tissue injury and then uh, derive mesenchymal stem cell and activated the mesenchymal stem cell. So the proposed sequence is that these pericytes, when they sense tissue injury or if they are pre-activated by mechanical process, they could then uh, generate MSC and regenerative effect of the MSCs. 
which as you know can be both immunomodulatory but also anti-apoptotic, anti-scarring, angiogenic, metotic and antimicrobial. So this is a, one of the lipogen cluster. If you actually put these clusters in culture, you can derive uh, expanded mesenchymal stem cells uh, like for advanced cell therapy products like you would do expansion of MSCs from bone marrow or other product. But the interesting thing that is uh, our hypothesis now is that for many clinical applications it's much better to inject actually the preserved niche where the cells are because then when you put them in vivo they can do this job and start activating and proliferating but without having to go through an advanced cell product at start. So you remain in minimally manipulated tissue transfer, autologous tissue, and uh, hopefully with much less regulatory requirements. You can uh, expand though these cells in culture if you want, just plating the microcluster and then <coughs> fresh culture cells give you this profile of, uh, of CD markers and cryopreserve. They're maintaining cryopreserve and thawed cell culture, so there is the possibility to cryopreserve and thaw. <coughs> the product. And uh, interestingly, these are uh, data from Bruno Peult, UCLA. Uh, the pericyte component of the lipogem, 73.3%, is much uh, higher than the uh, one observed in lipoaspirates or in whole fat at the, at the beginning of the process. So the the theory now, the hypothesis is that the native microenvironment is very important and maintaining this adipose niche that preserves the pericytes, MSCs, and the stromal vascular fraction in, their, in, their microenvir in the native microenvironment may be, may be very important. But also there is, besides the structural scaffold, <coughs> there is some new evidence that has been just presented at IFAT by Bruno Peult group, that is that you activate pericyte through the processing so that the secretome of this cell's cluster change through the processing. So it's different to what you have in a native uh, lapoaspirate. And uh, this has been presented, it's not published yet, but in summary what they saw that the culture appeared to secrete more cytokine and angiokine, that it's digested equivalent if you use enzymes. And, uh, we also have novel data that will be published soon on the proteomic and secretome of the, of the lipogen product. So the regulatory pathway now that has been approved in Europe, in the USA, as 10 k China, Australia, and other countries. And there have been a lot of uh, clinical cases performed, over 5,000 uh, as of June 2015, mainly in Europe, but now also in, in, in other continents with uh, a very positive, good safety profile and uh, many different applications from uh, radiotherapy, breast phase, vocal cord incontinence, colorectal, uh, steroid induced bone necrosis, diabetic ulcers and wounds, and non-healing non fractures. This uh, is an example of a Charcot <coughs> foot in a, in a subject that uh, uh, was unable to walk and now is walking very well, it's walking so well that it's going uphill vertically and perpendicular to the, to the picture, as you can see. So this is the proof that is an amazing, amazing results. Yeah. Try to do that. <laughs> I don't know why, on a Mac it is on the right side, on the PC it goes uphill. Uh, there are more planned clinical trials uh, from the cancer treatment of Center of America to determine the effect on reversal of radiation injury in selected clinical settings. And uh, uh, this is a case of uh, vocal cord reconstruction. Testa destra. Lunedì, martedì, mercoledì. This is before. Giovedì. And this is after one week. Da parte. Lunedì, martedì, mercoledì. Means Monday. Giovedì, venerdì, sabato e domenica. And this was one month after. So this allowed to do vocal cord reconstruction. Using a very little, um, very fine needle in local anesthesia because of the fluidity of the product. So these are other applications. It, it, everything started from a plastic maxillofacial reconstructive surgery. This is an hemifacial atrophy correction that they uh, did. and. Uh, 
and also has been then exploring more and more uh, regenerative uh, application besides plastic and maxillofacial surgery. Some of the most interesting results have been obtaining anal incontinency. Uh, I don't have time to go through all the details, but this is the, the procedure practically. Uh, and these are the results as far as uh, uh, quality of, of life score, but also manometry and waxer incontinence score. And what you see, like if you inject just mesenchymal stem cells or single cells, generally you, you relapse within months. At six months, you may be uh, back to where you are at the beginning. So the interesting thing with this product is that for two years is maintaining function and is maintaining uh, manometric also pressures, which I don't have here. So this is uh, the imaging intraoperative, three months, six months, and at 12 months it seems to reconstruct part of the sphincter anatomy uh, with uh, increasing pressure values that rest in, squ in squeeze after treatment and uh, the endoanal ultrasound, ultrasound confirmed the improvements. So the, uh, the regenerative effect <coughs> uh, observed appar appear initially as an anti-inflammatory and analgesics within the first three days, and then later you have this progressive effect on skin, muscle, cartilage, and bone that appears after a minimum of four weeks and continue to improve for many months, usually well beyond uh, one year. So there is a, a slow but continuous eff chronic effect of these um, uh, products. So there is a, uh, what the surgeon observed is you have no swelling and bruising and immediate return to social life, so that is very appreciated by patients. This is a, I will not show it to you because it's a very disgusting video, but it's a, on eyelids technique, but uh, it shows how, how little is actually the injury in non-invasive the procedure is. And this is the patient uh, I showed before with the eyelid back treatment and uh, after the procedure this is one week post-op in this male subject and these are other application in orthognatic surgery reduce swelling and improve healing this was published in cellar 4 recently <coughs> these are uh, bone regeneration in difficult cases of oral surgery applications uh, this is a Professor Benzin in Italy that started using Lipogem for these applications and uh, I will not go through the detail but had full restoration and ability to rebuild the bone and implants. So it appears that there is an increase of osteogenic potential when you use li Lipogems in bone application in orthopedic for reconstruction of bones and uh, when you compare it to isolated uh, uh, adipose-derived stem cells from either digested lipogems or digested whole fat. So it seems that uh, maintaining just the mechanical processing and not adding collagen, is, it helps <coughs> the osteogenic potential. This is a case of an infected delayed union fracture treated nine months earlier. Uh, was uh, no sign of healing, was treated with, the, uh, with his own fat process with lipogem and then 10 months post-op was a complete recovery. <coughs> there was, a, these are cases of non-healing leg ulcers, 93 cases that were treated, 76% with complete healing in less than six months. And this was an, an actually an animal experiment, a preclinical experiment that I recommended not to do because it's complete ligation of femoral artery and div division of the femoral artery and it says how can you inject lipogem and save the limb is, there is no time to even develop collateral circulation with such an acute intervention but to, to our surprise if you inject locally just at the site of uh, femoral artery injury we were able to recover the muscle and avoid the atrophy that follows instead if you inject just saline these are other cases of diabetic ulcers, <coughs> and uh, now there are three major centers in Italy doing uh, trials uh, in diabetic foot uh, ulcers. Why is stuck? Uh, this is a, a, in orthopedic application and cartilage repair. Everything started from this uh, 
uh, racing horse Coldplay that is very famous in Italy is uh, owned by a cardio cardiac surgeon like some three four million dollar horse and suddenly was unable to walk they were going to put him down couldn't even feed himself and uh, underwent the lipogen procedure before uh, before this was tested in uh, using clinical trials and uh, and to the surprise uh, or pleasure of the owner, the, the horse started walking and jumping again. Uh, so this raised the attention of the orthopedic community, and uh, these were the actual uh, arthros the, the chondropathy case of that horse with the biopsy, uh, showing that there was a new cartilage being formed following the injection of the lipogen product. And this is a horse tendinopathy uh, another case uh, that was uh, very successful. So there are also applications for veterinary uh, vet veterinary treatment that are currently uh, used, uh, including horses and even cats now being treated for renal. Are they mixing it with their this is one of those paste gel that they use in uh, in orthopedic. This is for femoral head necrosis. Acrylate gel. I have no idea. Do you know, Barbara, what gel? They're using the, but is a, uh, or those metrics that they use. Maybe it's crash bone even oh, the one that. Even the it is. So this is another experience. Uh, this is a very early new application in, uh, <coughs> in, in disc uh, herniated disc uh, nucleoplastic with lipogen transplant. Professor Grossi was just presented at the European Society for Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy. Basically, uh, what they do is, alt under a fluoroscopy, <coughs> control the correct positioning and uh, perform a percutaneous discectomy and then uh, a fibrous ring ablation followed by autologous lipogen transplant and uh, with very encouraging uh, preclinical initial clinical results and only 45 minutes of procedure that that is very well uh, appreciated by the, by the surgeons. This is another experience that was just recently presented by Konrad uh, Slinarski from uh, Poland that has a huge practice in orthopedic for treatment of orthoarthritis of the knee and uh, these were 60 patients age 18 to 83 <coughs> with orthostritis in the knee. And uh, this is like the chaos score at one month and six months improving on all subscales. Uh, and uh, all subscales uh, improvement demonstrated, but also we have some imaging here in this case too. This was a 57 year old female treated was not suitable for surgery because of chronic lymphedema. And this is the, the reappearance of uh, three weeks after lipogen, the knee range of motion improved from zero to 130 degrees and was stable for the following 12 months. <coughs> this is another case before lipogen and three months after lipogen. <coughs> the pain scale and the cost score significantly improved at MRI showed healing of the bone, medial femoral and tibial condyles, covering of the medial femoral condyle with newly formed cartilage-like and meniscus-like tissue in place of the removed uh, tissue. This is uh, another uh, case in which uh, 21 male with ski injury three years before with a tear of the lateral meniscus one year after arthroscopy uh, with lateral meniscus suturing and eight months after this procedure he recovered but his symptoms came back after another trauma. So you should stop doing ski racing if you have an initial trauma because there is a, a, a chance to get a trauma again. And the MRI after the second trauma showed no additional tear but cartilage defect on the medial femoral and tibial condyle indicated here. Uh, MRI before lipogems injections so showing the defect <coughs> and uh, MRI five months after lipogem injection showing cartilage defect healed and meniscus healing also observed. 
So in summary, this is a, has been a pretty easy and simple procedure to use for, um, for orthopedic and sport medicine application. And there are many more trials now undergoing, especially in Europe, but beginning also in, uh, in selected centers in United uh, States. This is another case of non-responsive knee, uh, knee pain with orthoarthritis and concurrent meniscal disease. And these were just this improvement in the scores, the pain scale, and the imaging also in this case showing prior to treatment and after treatment, uh, uh, MRI six months post-treatment with an improved thick and articular cartilage measured by a radiologist at 1.5 millimeters versus the 0 0.75 pre-treatment. So in, in conclusion, this has been a a rather simple, ready-to-be-used kit that could be of assistance for several uh, regenerative medicine application with point of care, doesn't require specialized equipment or facility. The timing is very short and reduced from a harvesting to, to having a product ready for, uh, for the patients to, to be treated. And uh, I'm confident that you will hear much more from uh, randomized prospective trials that are ongoing and being planned uh, worldwide like right now. So thank you for your attention. Thanks. I was. Yeah, just to comment uh, on the on the pancreas uh, issue. We actually use collagen. As the, the the change in the pancreas was from going from single cell dispersion and purification of beta cells that didn't work to to keep the niche and the islets intact as a microorgan that is up to 500 microns and can contain a thousand to two thousand cells. But it's not that we inject microfragments of uh, pancreas. So it's a, it's a quite different processing with the chamber that we process the pancreas. The screen is to retain the undigested tissue while you have a collagenous and another protease enzyme mixture or, or enzyme blend that progressively disassemble the pancreas from the duct system, from the exocrine. So it's, a, it's quite different, but a lot of the concepts are similar because we maintain the niche, we don't use centrifugation anymore, you settle the eyelids before transplanting to avoid uh, uh, stress and injury. So, and there is a lot of attention doing everything in a complete closed system, avoiding air fluid interface so that uh, some of the tricks from the eyelids have been useful also for fat processing. Um, no, actually we have the presenter of the IDF meeting is a trial that we did in collaboration with uh, China and is actually umbilical cord expanded MSCs plus uh, autologous bone marrow <coughs> process but injected in the pancreas, in the pancreatic artery through interventional radiology to avoid these cells to be trapped prevalently by the lung and has been quite interesting. The, the one-year results are very interesting. The five years follow-up will come out soon, and um, there have been preservation of C-peptide uh, uh, at one year with results similar to what was observed by the Karolinska group injecting expanded MSC at the onset of type 1 diabetes. I don't think MSC alone will be a solution for, for autoimmunity and type 1, but could be the reason we wanted to do this trial is to show safety to then combine them with regulatory T cells and with other uh, immunomodulatory strategies. So they could be an important component, especially for the non-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory uh, component that is required for any tolerance induction treatment to, to succeed long term. So if you have inflammation in the very early treatment time, you, you cannot induce tolerance to an organ transplant or in an autoimmune setting. Um, I just have a question for you. Um, what What do you think of the um, regulatory tissue guidances for adipose tissue that the FDA just presented? Do you think that presents a threat to this? Mm. I didn't, uh, I didn't study them in detail, but I saw some commentaries and some, uh, something in the LinkedIn group of uh, cell industry mm -hmm. group uh, that was quite interesting because they were outlining some paragraph like that some from FDA comments were that if you inject fat in the breast uh, is non-homologous use mm -hmm. because you are supposed to have ductal tissue that produce milk in the breast and not fat. 
And uh, I think that is a dangerous, slippery slope, and I, I wish and I hope that FDA will stay out of tissue, autologous tissue grafting, because then you can make everything FDA. Then I would want to see why not a liver transplant or any organ that you transplant in an ectopic place. If you transplant the pancreas in the iliac space instead of, a, <coughs> it's not even draining through the portal system, it's going systemic insulin delivery, then that is not an homologous use, should be treated as an advanced cell therapy. But if you let a regulatory agency alone without feedback and proper, you know, let's be reasonable. There is already so much complexity in the regulatory system that if you start uh, making your life uh, uphill and hitting walls everywhere, including autologous, minimally manipulated fat tissue, is like, um, it would be a disaster, personal opinion. All right, well, thanks everybody for attending and uh, hope you have a nice meeting.